and welcome along to Kingdom, where we are definitely coming to you live from Block 42 now Avenue. Almost say welcome along to Kingdom Kampala. Well, we're coming to you live from Block 42 Nile Avenue. I'm Jerome Boltsonko with Winnie Wins and Akauti on sign language. And we kick started off with our very fast report. As many public servants have had to celebrate Christmas without their December pay, which contradicts government's commitment to sorting out this matter uh, before Christmas, as told by Parliament's Finance Minister, Matia Kasaija, on Friday last week. We have more in this report. The legislature had assurances from the Finance Minister, Honorable Matia Kasaija, last week that salaries for public employees would be paid before Christmas. He even asked to leave Ali so that he could personally manage the situation. I told you salaries, please, are, are statutory. Mm. And they have cast a call on the budget. Now that my colleague here has confirmed that the preparation are going on, this money should be today. We, we, we are operating Very good. Yes. So uh, the minister has made a commitment on the money uh, that is... Uh, I want us to conclude so that he goes to ensure that his uh, commitment is implemented. Yes. <laughs> However, according to our anonymous source, this was not taken into consideration and nothing was added to their accounts. As a result, they were forced to spend the festive period without money to celebrate with their families. The Ministry of Finance attributed these to wage increases for science teachers and healthcare professionals, but the State Minister for Public Service said that since the salary increases occurred in May of last year before the start of the fiscal year, they could not have had an impact on the payment process. And the financial year started um, in July, on the 1st of July. And by that time, that report was already overtaken because the salaries were increased for, for all scientists across board. Therefore, we should not concentrate on overtalking about increment of salaries for scientists again. We should look now at the issue of increasing salaries across board for all civil servants. Because when you check on the reports, you find that some nurses have been enhanced 130%, 110%, meaning at least their issue is handled. Silas Aogon, a Kumi municipality member of parliament, wants the government to treat the issue of salaries seriously if it is to retain skilled labor, particularly in the health sector. Is what keeps your labor moving as a country. And if you don't attend to it, then you know you are trying to impede your progress as a country. So when people make concerns around salaries and disparities, it is real and it has connotations that can bring the country's progress down. So nobody should take it lightly. For me, I stand with those who are agitating to be given what they ought to be given, because it's their right, first of all. But also, it is a motivational factor. Once you pay people the money that they are supposed to be paid, they get motivated to do their work. We are talking about, for instance, medical interns. These are critical in the service delivery, particularly in the health sector. You can play about any other thing, but not health, because to me, that one really touches the life of everyone, including His Excellency, the President of the Republic of Uganda. The legislator also suggests that government should look into the issue of civil servant compensation inequalities because they have noticed that certain civil workers receive excessive salaries compared to others who perform the same task, which is unfair. About the civil service, the public service, you find in this entity somebody is getting bigger money. In the other entity, there are times when we used to hear that KCCA, if you were working with the KCCA, you'd be getting a lot of money. A driver would be earning money that somebody is leading another organization within government. You can imagine that kind of thing. So what causes this? As long as people are getting money from the consolidated fund, there has to be a proper mechanism of making sure that those who are having the same kind of qualification and the same kind of uh, money. Those who do the same kind of work and the same am amount of money. In her speech to the legislature, Honorable Namu Gagoretti warned MPs that the administration has long neglected the fact that majority of civil officials lack motivation, which results in poor performance. Look at the institutions of government. 
For now, I'm still resisting that temptation. But if you continue, I will go that line. And I know how tough that line can be. You went, you reduced salaries of police officers. Someone who has been earning a salary for 10 years. You come from nowhere and you say, this is not your salary. Okay? Yes. Then you have people. Uh, I saw the letter from the, uh, from the permanent secretary, minister of public service. If you people don't want parliament to do its work, it's unfortunate. The issue of delaying salaries for public servants is not something new. It has been happening for many years and lawmakers think the problem arises from the Ministry of Public Service, which they call a place of organized chaos that needs to be restructured. Samla Hanifa, Smart 24 TV, Business Today. Now let's look at the East African community and the youth innovation. In order to promote youth innovations in the East African community and address the challenge of youth poverty by creating employment in accordance with the East African Community Vision 2050, the East African Youth Forum has called for more funding to invest in agriculture, technology, among us, the other things. Samuel Kiramunda compiled this report. Youth Ambassador for Kenya, Waya Rimo Manyara, called for more support for young innovators to address the issue of jobless in the community while speaking to journalists at the East African Youth Forum. Although 70% of the East African community is young, unemployment is a significant challenge in the community. Every innovation you sponsor, right, that's a business you've been able to sponsor. For every business you sponsor, that's five, for example, you create employment for five more youth out there or for ten more youth out there. So why it's important for us to focus on this from a bottom-up approach is that as opposed to focusing on just getting people jobs, you create or you give one youth the capacity to start a business. They're able to start or create employment for 20 more youth within the region in itself. And I think it's also important within the ESC context because I can be able to trade goods from Kenya to Uganda, for example, through the East African community. So even the more we develop this regionally as opposed to nationally, we open our access to markets for youth innovations so we also don't necessarily end up competing just in Kenyan borders and then we fluctuate our markets with the same products when there's access to markets all over the region. Thank the regional coordinator for East Africa Community Youth Network Jack Tosime additionally added that government of Uganda should coordinate with ICT framework in the area to guarantee that the cost of data used for communication, such as Facebook and other platforms, should be reduced. So when you talk about unlocking the youth potential, you're talking about unlocking the whole of East African community because the youth are the majority. And when they improve and they invest in technology, will solve as many problems as possible. This uh, event is focusing on uh, six pillars. We are talking about uh, innovation in energy, innovation in ICT, innovation in agriculture, innovation in health, and uh, we are focusing also on the climate change. And uh, those are the issues that we are grappling with as the East African co community, the seven partner states. And we are saying that when we invest in, um, for example, agriculture, where we have the incomparative advantage, we are going to create very many jobs where young people face challenges of unemployment. If we invest in uh, climate change, we are going to sort the challenges that we are seeing in climate change. And uh, we want to put the young people at the forefront of this because we believe that we, the ESC has a vision 2050. And this vision 2050 will be achieved if young people are put at the forefront. The internet connectivity in the ESC is at one out of five. You can imagine 20% of the East Africans are the one, only ones who are accessing internet. So how are you going to improve ICT and innovation if people are still not uh, using uh, uh, technology? Another thing is the issue of data. If you look at the region among the regional economic blocks, the ESC has the highest data uh, prices. You can look at Uganda, for example. We still have an issue of Facebook, which the president even, uh, I don't know what happened. So we need to ensure that we bring data prices down to ensure that we promote innovation. That is one. Two, we must ensure that we harmonize the ICT and the STI uh, frameworks in the region. 
The Permanent Secretary for East African Community Affairs, Edith Mwanje, disclosed that there are specific procedures that must be followed where the Council of Ministers make policies decisions together with coordinating committees to achieve and handle the difficulties in the community. We have a Council of Ministers that takes policy decisions. We have a summit of heads of state that makes the uh, gives direction and impetus on which direction we should be moving. But we also have a, a meeting of uh, permanent secretaries, which is called the Coordination Committee, and then technical meetings. So those ones are take decisions, research is done at the technical level, it's pushed up until uh, the council makes policy, and then advises the, the heads of state. And then also we have, of course, the ESC secretariat. So it's, it's a lot. We have arrangements, we have the court, we have the YALA. All those help us to achieve, uh, to form actually, to, to achieve what we want to achieve. The community's most valuable resource is its human capital, which includes the full mobilization and effective participation of all East Africans, including men, women and the youth for social and national advancement. Youth should receive proportionate recognition and engagement in all national and regional development efforts because they make up the largest population group in the East African community. In order to create a legally binding framework for the efficient implementation, monitoring and evaluation of youth programs and initiatives, the Sectoral Council's recommendations led to the adoption of the East African Community Youth Policy in August 2013. Andrew Barije, Samuel Chirimunda, Smart24 Business Today. And now we talk matters micro, small and medium sized enterprises. As the micro, small and medium sized enterprises are the engine of growth for the economic development of Uganda, well, indeed, when you look at the world at large, it is also a very uh, fundamental sector. They are spread across all sectors with 49% in the service sector, 33% in commerce and trade, 10% in manufacturing, and 8% in the others. Now, despite the sector's enormous size and contribution to Uganda's economy, it has faced various challenges that have hindered economic growth. We have more in this report. There is insufficient policy framework to effectively realize the entire growth potential of MSMEs to economic development. A variety of initiatives have been developed by the government, development parties, and the private sector to support and expand the MSME sector. But these efforts have been mostly dispersed, uncoordinated, conflicting, and isolated. And I think that the government should look into this. I mean, for God's sake, was this, is this the best time to increase the interest rates? Is it, that doesn't that uh, maybe isn't it a, a, a negative progress towards the increasing aggregate demand? Because <clears throat> we still had a challenge of uh, a low aggregate demand. Now, certain policies are, I think must be discussed in a view of not only the physical policy but also in the view of business, business development. I think the best idea would be is that when passing certain policies, the business, com the business community must be involved so that we know the implications of certain policies, be it physical or any other. What will be the implication on the business community? Small and medium-sized businesses are less likely than large businesses to be able to acquire bank loans. Therefore, they must instead rely on internal resources like cash from friends and family to start and run their businesses, a practice that restricts their ability to expand, improving credit infrastructure, which can lead to improved SME access to finance, as well as introducing innovation in SME finance, such as e-lending platforms, e-invoicing, e-factoring, and supply chain financing can benefit SMEs. Uh, some of our section of traders import from China for the last three years China is closed so they cannot access their goods that is one and also uh, the, 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 the small small traders who left shops and then they went into working they are also facing it hard on the streets they can't contact their businesses here so the money is dwindling every day people are becoming poorer every day they cannot access cheap loans and those who can access cheap loans they don't know how to most of them have lost addresses and that is key in getting uh, financial assistance from uh, financial institutions. 
the International Finance Corporation estimates that 65 million businesses or 40 percent of former micro, small, and medium sized enterprises in developing countries have annual financing needs of 5.2 trillion US dollars or 1.4 times the level of global MSMEs lending, which are all unfulfilled. In consultation with sector players, the government is in collaboration with SME support organizations to harmonize all these present policy issues. Martha Nimsima, Smart 24 TV, Business Today. All right, now let's talk. Mark is the aftermath of the Christmas celebrations. In the wake of Christmas, retailers in Kampala's downtown and uptown areas are still reporting low business sales. Uh, this is not what they anticipated for this particular time this year, apparently. But this year's holiday season has seen a reduction in sales, which was first seen on the eve of the season. Ronia Katusime reports. <laughs> The marginal propensity to consume for an individual was formerly estimated at 75%, but now it stands at 15%. Thus, traders are not feeling the rewards of the holiday season. The season's profits have been impacted by the COVID epidemic and the economy, accompanied by individuals going to various towns and villages. The rate at which people are spending money and purchasing goods is extremely low that even the seasonal merchandise is not moving. Additionally, COVID-19 told people how to set priorities and adopt the saving culture. Christmas sells the Sales have disappointed. If we had to compare the last year's festive seasons in a percentage, we used to sell at least 75%, but this season has been on just 30, if better, 40. Customers are few and people with money who buy from us traveled. Some of us just came back to check on our stock, but there is no money. Although the economic condition in the country could have affected the purchasing power of potential customers, Fred, the gadget seller, continues to explain some of the challenges they face in these businesses. Some of the hardships we face are the high taxes, high costs of living, which affects the pricing of our commodities and makes our customers think we sell these products expensively. Women and young people are the biggest spenders not just during the holiday season, but also because of their enjoyment of new fashion trends. Although the nation's economic situation may have had an impact on potential customers' spending power, we should remain confident that sales will increase in the days to come as we approach a new year. Bronya Katsime, Smart24 TV, Business Today. All right, besides that, let's look at the role of the Bank of Uganda in regulating the financial sector. Now, the stability of the economy and the financial system depends heavily on central banks. In order to achieve low and stable inflation, they implement the monetary policy. Following the global financial crisis, central banks have added more tools to their arsenals to address threats to financial stability and control fluctuating exchange rates. We have more in this report. The financial system fosters economic expansion and development by directing, organizing, and distributing savings to profitable industries. A few government-owned and private banks that focused on finance, manufacturing, agriculture, and trade made up the majority of the banking sector in the early 1990s. Prior to the 1990s economic reforms, the Bank of Uganda set the structure and level of interest rates. Unfortunately, the economy was hit by a deep recession, which resulted in a negative interest rate. The, both the deposit and the lending rate were far, far below the inflation rates. And, for example, the uh, annual inflation rate averaged 100% in the 1990s, while the nominal lending uh, rate for commerce, uh, for commerce and term deposits um, accounts averaged 31 and 24 percent respectively. Starting in the early 1990s, the government of Uganda implemented a number of changes to strengthen the financial sector. These reforms included strengthening monetary policy, enhancing resource mobilization, and fostering competition in financial markets, among others. So these interventions covered three main areas. One, there was the institutional reforms to the Bank of Uganda, and the public sector banks. And then two, 
There were legislative changes to the banking laws and the Bank of Uganda Act. And finally, the economic liberalization uh, covering both interest rates and the exchange rate. So this was fundamental in terms of the reforms that were being undertaken. So without really deeply delving into individual reforms, suffice it to say that uh, they unshackled the financial sector from a constraining common controls, thereby freeing it to intermediate uh, savings and investments more effectively. The Bank of Uganda was not able to administer monetary and supervisory policies based on expert judgment due to legal reforms, including the Bank of Uganda Statutes of 1993. Monetary policy targeted average annual inflation of 5% through open market operations. And bank supervision moved away from box-keeping exercise of compliance checks to a more risk-based supervision with minimal forbearance. The Financial Institutions Act of 2004 further strengthened the licensing supervision and closure of regulated financial institutions, which was fully delegated now to Bank of Uganda. And the Bank of Uganda executed this role following international best practices, such as the Basel Core Principles of Banking Supervision. Uganda's inflation has been relatively low in recent decades compared to the late 1880s and early 1990s when core inflation was in the single digits, averaging 5% except in 2011 and 2012. Up to the recent rise brought on by the COVID-19 pandemic and the start of the Russia-Ukraine war, the Bank of Uganda kept inflation in the low single digits. Furthermore, Lending rates have steadily declined from an average of 38% in 1992 to an average of 18% in 2021, whereas those in the East African community are at 16%. For context, the annual headline inflation and co-inflation rose to 10.6 and 8.8 in November 2022, up from 2.7 and 2.3 in January of 2022. So here, Bank of Uganda took serious actions to contain that inflation. And then secondly, on the lending rates, the persistently high lending rates increase business costs and crowd out some sectors whose rates of return may be lower, yet they are critical for economic growth and employment. For example, the agricultural sector. The Bank of Uganda continues to strengthen its supervisory regime through supervision and the introduction of new products like internet banking and Islamic banking products, among others. The users for internet banking have increased to 17.7% in the year ending June 2022, from 7,000 in June 2021 to 800,000 in June 2022. New products have been matched, including bank assurance, mobile banking, internet banking, increased card payments, and Islamic banking products are imminent, among others. In the year ending June 2022, the number of active users of internet banking increased by 17.7% from um, 700,000 in June 2021 to 800,000 in June 2022. Interbank, banking, I mean, interbank transactions more than doubled reflecting a 225% growth from 1.2 million transactions to 3.9 million transactions over the same period, while transaction volumes nearly doubled from 13.4 trillion to uh, 24.5 trillion shillings. In an effort to lower the cost of digital transactions, the Bank of Uganda and the Uganda Revenue Authority have called for more public and private sector regulations. They urge that the expenses associated with mobile banking, mobile money, and other digital or electronic transactions are now too expensive and are impeding to development of financial inclusion in the nation. According to Mike Ating Ego, the Deputy Governor, Bank of Uganda, the poor are more negatively impacted by mobile money transaction charges because small transaction movers control the platforms. There are several barriers that remain. Key among them are the high transaction costs. On net, mobile money transactions cost between 30 shillings to 1,250 for sending and 330 to 20,000 for withdrawing. And Uganda shillings 160 to 6,300 for payment of utilities inclusive of 
taxes. Interoperability costs range from 330 to 20,000 shillings. Furthermore, the charges are regressive, with the vulnerable poor who consist the majority of users by transactional account bearing the heaviest burden. Statistics indicate that approximately 90% of the mobile money transactions are in the low value of under 50,000. So you can imagine that the tax burden is hitting the poor. So I hope Chris, this message is thinking in change. According to him, while there has been good progress in financial inclusion courtesy of mobile financial services, the cost regime is unfair to the poor, who also contribute most of the tax revenues from the sector. Financial inclusion as a result of the above is now standing at 66% compared to 59% in 2017, with mobile money as a key driver. The report showed that mobile money services increased uh, the value remittances by 36% and was associated with 13% increase in per capita consumption. However, the same report indicated that 41% of the Ugandans could not access financial services due to the distances involved in reaching access points. The cost of moving money from one platform to another, which varies from provider to provider, is one of the factors contributing to the high costs of mobile transactions. The National Payment Systems Act has increased the number of service providers over the past one and a half years, although this has not yet resulted in a significant decrease in costs. The national payment switch, according to the deputy governor, will lower transaction costs between networks once it's operational. We've had a number of consultations with this, the key stakeholders uh, of this national payment switch the payment system providers, the banker, the development partners. We've had significant discussions with them to understand better that what kind of switch, payment switch, does, does Uganda require? Given our systems here, what type of switch do we require? So we have had the discussions, and as a result, those discussions have culminated into what we call the business and the technical requirements for this business switch. The countrywide switch will assist in monitoring transactions as they happen and allow Uganda Revenue Authority to immediately tax them, according to Moses Kagwa, the Director of Economic Affairs at the Ministry of Finance. This, along with the unexpected decrease in the cost of transferring money, will, in his perspective, result in an increase in revenue collections. At least you get these transactions on the system and you can see the transactions that are flowing. If they are business transactions, at least you will get to know that uh, one business has uh, received money from another business, or somebody has sent money to a business through this uh, system. Now, what has been happening is that the companies, the fintech companies, uh, the companies under Airtel and um, MTN, have their own systems, which have been expensive. So the cost of uh, <coughs> remitting this money has been high. But if we have a national payment system, that would mean that the charges are going to be low. Even with the increased digitization and how it is assisting in revenue collecting, John Musinguzi, the URA Commissioner General, stated that a sizable portion of the economy, the informal sector, continues to be the most difficult to tax, mostly due to lack of records. According to him, this means that although they are significant economic contributors, they cannot be tracked. It will help us have better visibility of financial flows and therefore of incomes, where money is being made. And that will give us an advantage or clear information on how to tax them. It is important to digitize money and the flow of incomes. That way, it leaves a trail, and that trail helps the tax administrators to effectively assess and tax those transactions without any guesswork. Naomi Mtumba, Smart 24 TV. <laughs>
स्मार्ट ट्वेंटी फोर ड्राइविंग बिजनेस गेटिंग टूगेदर फॉर द फर्स्ट टाइम इन इयर्स वॉज अ लिटल बिट ऑकवर्ड ग्रैंडपा स्टिल ट्राई टू एंटरटेन अस मॉम वॉज ऑलवेज टू इन द स्पॉट लाइट फ्रॉम द किड्स It wasn't until Grandma cracked a joke. That's my favorite prayer. That we got back into our groove. In this festive, DSTV is making family time even better with an upgrade. Stay connected to DSTV, and we'll upgrade you to the next package for free. of Uganda in a new international park Mukwano Yes I need you to help me wash the kids I'm going to pay school fees I finished Excuse me Uh 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 relax Sit down watch TV I've already paid Chikole fole sakona so no stress whether night or day to the okay wanna to the go fancy fair Don't have so to pay bills or send money to call it for less me flexi pay oh it to call it for less with flexi pay dial star 291 hash to transact or download the flexi pay app to get started stand big bank it can be Stand Big Bank is regulated by the Bank of Uganda and customer deposits are protected by the Deposit Protection Fund of Uganda up to 10 million shillings Smart 24 driving business We'll be back from the break and let's continue with more business today. And in our coffee good tonight, we take a look at tea, tea growing in the country. Now, tea is predominantly a grown crop in uh, most places of high altitude that have chill weather, uh, especially the climate all over the world. Now, this is why farmers like Masiko Onesmus uh, grow it in Chenjojo and other areas like Kabarore. Now annually Uganda earns about 84 million US dollars and tea is one of the country's traditional exports. We we'll get to discuss more about Uganda's tea growth in tonight's coffee cup. Well, it is a pleasure and thank you for joining us on this coffee court where we ask the critical questions, but critical questions that matter. And as the year draws towards the end, we examine the contribution of the Uganda Development Corporation, especially looking at some of the members that have been a benefit of this corporation. This time round, I speak to Mr. Masko Nesmas. He is an agronomist, but is also the manager. of mabale growers when it comes to issues of tea growing we examine the contribution of tea growing and the impact of udc on their performance mr masikonesmas it's a pleasure thank you for joining us thank you very much 
You are an expert in the tube growing, but let's first and foremost talk about uh, UDC, where you have moved, how and how you've moved with it. Thank you very much. UDC has two phases in its contribution to this economy. <clears throat> the first phase was before independence, where most of the government-owned businesses were under the docket of UDC. So talking about 1960s? Bef before 1960s. Oh. Um, the history of tea, I can't divorce any talk from tea. Tea in Uganda was predominantly a plantation, large-scale plantation crop, 1930s, 40s, 50s. Ugandans were not in deep into tea growing, and the largest tea plantation company today was set up by Uganda Development Corporation in the 1950s. That's how old UDC dates back into our industry. And then 1960s, when Uganda decided, after independence, when we decided to popularize tea growing among Ugandans in smallholder mode, again, a corporation was set up to promote tea growing among smallholder farmers. That was called Uganda Tea Growers Corporation. And again, that was a subsidiary of Uganda Development Corporation. So when, when we privatized as a country strategically, most of these companies were sold to investors and the, the plantations were sold to foreign direct investors while the factories, tea factories serving smallholder farmers were sold to farmers themselves. And then government went out. Then the current UDC, I'm not an expert on UDC's history, but UDC was reconstituted and then as a parental role, government of Uganda through UDC again has recently brought in a supportive hand into especially the smallholder owned tea factory companies. Okay. So UDC in the tea subsector in Uganda dates back before 1960s all through to the present. Well, among the projects that Uganda Development Corporation supports are farmers that take their time to grow matters of tea. And I want to be exact. I've read statistics and I want to be exact on this. 40% of you of the tea that we consume. I want to pick the truth about that from you. 40% of Uganda's tea comes from the Toro subregion. Sure. And um, the subregion has two major segments. Plantations, I will tell you that the biggest tea plantations are located in the Toro sub-region. These are plantations owned by the Mukwano Group. These are plantations owned by McLeod Russell Group, which is the largest tea plantation company in the world, based in India, but it has plantations in Uganda again. These are plantations owned by Toro and Mitiana Tea Company, which he originally was under Mitchell Courts. So Toro sub-region, a combination of plantation tea companies and smallholder farmers pro contribute 40% of Uganda's tea production. I have also read that it is the second most consumed in the whole world. Is this also true statistics? You see, God created the most important things most affordable. So for example, air is the most important and it's totally free. Number two is water and it's almost free. So I want to imagine that tea is the third most important item in life. So God made it affordable and tea is the second most consumed beverage on earth. After water is also the second most affordable. And then I, I, I've also read, and I need to be sure that it's the third largest foreign agriculture exchange earner. How true is also this, Mr. Nesmas? You will recall the three C's and three T's, which made the skeleton of our economy from the historical times. T is one of them. So from historical times until present, T contributes... Um, lies in the third position on foreign exchange earnings from agricultural exports, number one being coffee, number two being fish. Fish has just appreciated, but still used to be the second after coffee. 
So once a while, maize comes up and then comes down, but tea is consistently in the top export foreign exchange earners for this country. And now that takes us to how many people grow the tea that you seem to be very passionate about in Uganda? We have what we can be very certain about is the acreage. 45,000 hectares of tea is grown by Uganda by Ministry of Agriculture um, estimates of 2018. And between that, around 30,000 hectares are in the hands of smallholder farmers who are estimated to around 30 to 40,000, but employees, tea as a subsector, tea growing, employees about 80,000 directly, direct employees, but up to around 1 million people in Uganda mm. derive their livelihood directly from the tea value chain. Okay. About 1 million Ugandans have their livelihood controlled by this value chain. So do we, all, do we consume all the tea that we grow incidentally as a no. country? Incidentally, no. Uh, I don't want to call it unfortunately or what, but incidentally, more than 90% of Uganda's tea is exported. Our major tea consuming countries is the Arab world, our colonial masters, the, the British, the Europeans, British specifically have a strong tea drinking culture, but the bulk of our tea goes to the Arab world. Number one, consumer of East African tea, and probably we shall come in later when I expand to own up as East Africa. The Arab world, Pakistan, is the largest importer of tea from East Africa, followed by Egypt. And all these other Arab countries are our major. We have a, a growing market in our immediate neighborhood, Southern Sudan, and Democratic Republic of Congo, except that Congo we are constrained by infrastructure and security, but this is a very big potential closed door, a close neighbor customer for Uganda's team. And now that you've talked about the challenges that you're going through, that will drive me straight to the contribution of Uganda Development Corporation. I know it's one of the key sectors that it has invested a lot of money. Let, let me now con make a connection between the tea growing and then the contribution of UDC. Have you really felt their contribution? I've said Uganda Development Corporation's contribution is very historical all the way up to present. UDC is the one which set up large-scale plantations. UDC is the one which set up smallholder serving tea factories. And after privatization, and uh, right now, UDC is the one which supported construction of tea factories in the new tea growing areas. You may recall that it is in the recent years that we introduced tea in Iksoro and in Kavale. We have introduced tea in Tungamo, in Rwampara, in Shema, in Zombo now. But UDC has the cardinal role of making sure that Ugandans are not stranded with their tea. And accordingly, they constructed a tea factory in Kavale under PPP, partnering with private sector and also in Iksoro. Now, for smallholder-owned tea factories, I told you these were set up by UDC in 1960s, and they were privatized. They are now owned by smallholder farmers, but smallholder farmers' capacity is limited. They were about to be swallowed by the unregulated environment, but the government still came in to come and and support the industry. Not just one player, because when one, one factory is weak, that is the main destination of farmers' produce, then the whole industry would basically collapse. Okay. So recently, Uganda Development Corporation decided to recapitalize Mavale Growers Tea Factory Limited. And this is a factory serving 2,300 shareholder farmers not only as farmers, but also as a destination for those farmers' production. So do they give out cash? Do they just come with maybe... What exactly do they do? 
the way the value chain operates is that for smallholder tea farming, a farmer takes charge of his garden, then a factory buys from a farmer. The farmer can deliver to the factory, or if a farmer is too small, the factory will deploy a truck which will aggregate collecting from many farmers and bring to the factory. So UDC's role is to make sure that this factory has capacity to serve the farmer in the most appropriate way. And the factory is capacitated to buy leaf from farmers at the most appropriate and equitable price prevailing in the green leaf tea marketing environment. Okay. Yeah. And what are these other major concerns that you think maybe UDC has not done? And given their aims and objectives, hopefully they need to come in and intervene and help in some of these other major challenges that probably the farmers are facing. There are three major challenges of the industry. One is the unbalanced processing capacity. You grow tea and you don't balance it with available processing factories. That's where UDC is coming in and other players are also allowed to come in. I will tell you, His Excellency the President has looked for us investors to contribute in this and to, to supplement what UDC is doing. That seems to be reasonably covered, that we are on course in setting up new factories to cover the industry. What remains glaringly uncovered are two. One is product quality. We earn less than our neighboring Rwanda. I will tell you that Uganda last year earned less than half of what Rwanda earned. How much did we earn? We earned $84 million from 82 million kilograms. Uganda's tea acreage has doubled. From what to what? From around 23,000 hectares, which we planted in 100 years. And in the next 20 years, under the current government, that 23,000 hectares has doubled to 45 acreage. Okay. But what a farmer is getting from a unit, a unit of, of the garden, a hectare to be exact. A hectare should be giving us about four tons of processed tea in a year. Okay. 2021, Uganda averaged 1,800, 1.8 tons versus the potential of four tons. What is the main problem? Fertilizer. So we don't have enough fertilizer or the fertilizer that we have is not good enough to facilitate tea growing in Uganda? There are two things. The latest, the current, is a world order where the, by the fertilizer prices have skyrocketed around the world. But even before then, our industry is not structured good enough to be able to afford a tea farmer fertilizer on credit. Who is to structure it? All of us. We, we what do you mean by all of us? Taxi all of us drivers, mean, vendors, and workers. When you say all of us, it, means of us mean it is in the hands of, of everybody. Us, but uh, <laughs> tea malt stakeholders. We have key, key stakeholders in tea. The tea processors, where UDC is playing, the tea farmers, the local government, the central government, Ministry of Agriculture, Ministry of Trade and Industry. Operation Wealth Creation, NADS. There are many stakeholders who have a role to play to structure this subsector so that a farmer can be traced. Traceability is one thing. So that we can have affordable finance, the banks come in, so that we can have credit facilities in a structure whereby farmers do not run away after picking that fertilizer on credit. Because the, the cost of financing fertilizer, even if it is capable of paying itself back, but the initial capital required is 
way beyond the capacity of a tea farmer on his own. So that means the, the Muntua once you cannot engage in such business. And by the way, now that we are drawing towards the end of the year, if I want to invest money in this kind of lucrative business, what is it exactly that I should have at the back of my mind? Mr. Nesmas. You need to understand, you need to be clear with your investment intentions. Tea is unique in one, one biggest uniqueness for tea is a constant stream of income to you, the investor. So are other cash crops? No. I'm a coffee farmer and I'm a tea farmer personally. Coffee brings in money once in a year. You'll die when it is out of season. Your kid will be thrown out of school when you are out of coffee season. So is tea? No way. Tea is harvested every seven to ten days. You come back and harvest where you harvested. You harvest throughout the year, and that's what I would interest you into investing. That if you are looking for constant revenues, it's like if you are a salaried person and you want to do retirement or you want supplements to your salary, the investment destination is tea. It doesn't have high profit margins, but it has constant cash flows that are typical for alleviation of household poverty. You're satisfied that government has done its best in regarding streamlining this kind of cash crop? It has done, it has done well to a certain extent, and I want to appreciate my government. And I want to encourage that let us complete the lap. We have played good football, but we are not scoring. We have planted 45,000 hectares of tea as a country, and we are milking from it half of what we should be. There is one switch to tap, and that is an intervention with fertilizer application into tea. And you see Uganda's tea exports earnings doubling from the 84 million to the 160 million in a nice twinkle within a harvesting season which is a rain season. And I hope government has been able to receive this message, especially through the Ministry of Agriculture, Animal Industry and Fishery. You want to make any confession uh, to the Uganda Development Corporation for their contribution as we plan to wind up, Mr. Nesmas. Our National Development Plan 3 is program-based and agriculture fits into agro-industrialization. While we have made big strides in 2T growing, just growing, I would like to encourage Uganda Development Corporation to take it a step further and interest itself in capacitating yield enhancement. And it's a job that UDC can do very well by coordinating fertilizer supply through processing factories, which are a big arm of UDC. Mr. Nesmas, thank you for speaking to us and traveling from wherever you've been. I know you've come a long way from Fort Potro. That is it. Moving forward as the year draws towards the end, I am convinced that come next year I must invest my money in growing tea. I have also understood that it's the second most consumed. I have also confirmed that 40% of the tea that we consume in Uganda uh, surprisingly comes from the Toro region. This is The Coffee Court and my name is Fred Makubuya. All right, and that is it for business today, and many thanks for being part of it tonight, wherever you've been catching us from. We've been coming to you live from Block 42, Nile Avenue. I'm Jerome Paul Sunko with Winnie Beans and Akauchi on Sign Language. Have a blessed night. Good evening.